The contents of the following program are not intended to substitute for the advice of your health care provider, and the producers of this series assume no liability for the use or misuse of the material presented. Creation or evolution? Design or random chance? They say it all began with a big bang. But when we look at the amazing human body, the answer is obvious. The complexity of the design exceeds anything man has ever made. The body could only have been designed by the master designer we read about in the Bible. Divine Design. Hello, I'm Patty Barnes, director of the Midwifery Program at Heartland College. Did you know that God has miraculously designed not only the reproductive system, but the absolutely amazing process of the developing fetus? By the way, please don't be offended by the word fetus. It is a Latin word that simply means young one. It is not a thing but a young human being, a developing baby. Let's return once again to Psalm 139, 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The word covered comes from a Hebrew word, sakak, which means to entwine or to weave or knit. Did you know that our skin is miraculously woven? The strength and the flexibility of our skin is on account of the way it is woven together. In verse 15, we find this truth repeated. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. The expression curiously wrought comes from the Hebrew word rakam, which means embroidered or weaved. With that in mind, let us look how masterly we are woven together, not just our skin, but every organ and tissue of our bodies. Perhaps you have wondered, as I have, how from a simple cell we can get a fully functional baby with all its parts and system. We might be able to grasp the cell division. But how do we explain how each cell knows what to do? And even more incredible, how do they all know how to interact in order to form anything? How is it that the genes are able to turn on and turn off? How is it that all the components work in harmony, like the bones, the organs, the tissues, etc., to form a living thing? person. It's no wonder that more and more biologists are believing in a creator. We saw earlier that the outer cells of the blastocyst, after it has implanted into the uterine wall, has the remarkable job of constructing the placenta, the baby's life support. Once that is accomplished, the inner cell mass begins the development of the embryo we find that one of the first things that occur is the formation of the three germ layers. They are called the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. All the baby's major organs and structures will develop from these three layers by a process called organogenesis. Now don't let these big words confuse or worry you. They are simply names describing the foundation of the various body tissues. First, let's look at the ectoderm. This is the outermost layer and is responsible for the development of all the central nervous tissue, such as the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral sensory tissue. It also will develop the more exterior parts, such as the epidermis, the hair, the sweat glands, the nails, the tooth enamel, and cornea, 
and lens of the eye, etc. Next is the mesoderm, the middle layer, which is responsible for the development of the skeleton, connective tissue, the cardiovascular, the lymphatic system, the kidneys, and blood, and so forth. Modern science is helping us to answer some of our questions, but we can't fully comprehend how this happens. Solomon, the wisest man on earth, said, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God, who maketh all. Finally, we come to the endoderm. This is the innermost layer and will form the digestive tract, the respiratory tract, the thyroid, and generates the formation of the major portions of the internal organs like the liver, lungs, and pancreas. During the last half of this embryonic stage, between four and seven weeks, the heart will begin beating. The placenta is maturing, the major organs are developing, and the brain is growing rapidly. By the seventh week, all the parts are in place that will develop into the human body. Beginning with the eighth week, rapid development and growth takes place. At this point, the mother should be extremely careful about teratogens. What are teratogens? These are substances or factors that can cause congenital malformations in the developing fetus. In other words, they adversely affect the growth and development of the baby. Some of the more common teratogens are drugs and medications, alcohol, nicotine and caffeine, pesticides and other chemicals, radiation, certain viruses, and porn of nutrition. Most people know that drugs may be harmful to a developing baby, but not everyone is familiar with the dangers of alcohol. Some birth defects associated with alcohol use may be stunted growth, brain, kidney, and heart damage, small head, misformed faces, low IQ, and alcohol addiction, because the baby has withdrawal symptoms. The term for this is called fetal alcohol syndrome. If you are pregnant, and drink alcohol. It will pass to the baby. There is no safe amount to drink, so please think about the welfare of your baby and abstain entirely from this teratogen. Now let us consider smoking. Did you know that cigarette smoke contains thousands of harmful chemicals that may cross the placenta? Here are just a few. Nicotine. This harmful substance can constrict the blood vessels, depriving the baby of precious oxygen and nutrients. Carbon monoxide. This poisonous gas depletes the mother's blood of oxygen. Cyanide. A poison. As a body tries to expel it, there is a depletion in protein and vitamin B12. Tar. The sticky brown substance damages the baby's lungs. And lead, this could damage the baby's brain. And if that isn't enough to concern you, smoking is the single greatest factor in low birth weight and a contributor to miscarriages and premature births. There's also an increased risk of SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome. Finally, Let's talk a moment about caffeine. Caffeine easily crosses the placenta and the baby lacks the enzymes to break it down into a harmless form. So what's the result? It may cause miscarriage and interfere with fetal growth, birth defects, and stillbirth. Because of these dangers, the FDA issued a warning for pregnant women to avoid or consume sparingly all foods and beverages containing caffeine. We can appreciate the Word of God and that we are truly fearfully and wonderfully made. 
And just as the baby that develops in the womb is perfect in every stage of development, so are we as Christians perfect in every stage of development. John 3.3 says, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We are to be born again in every stage of our new life. We can be perfect, not complete, but perfect as long as we cooperate in obedience to Him. Jesus taught this principle when He said, First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. These natural rules are a great parallel in what the Lord would like to do in all of us spiritually. Let's look some more on how that process works in the growth of the baby. At eight weeks, the baby is approximately half an inch in length. This is just an average as it will vary from one baby to another. As you can see, the head is larger than the trunk because the brain is growing rapidly. The arms and legs are beginning to grow. And notice here what evolutionists have falsely assumed was a tail as evidence of our animal ancestry. The truth is, this is no tail at all, but rather the spinal cord is just longer than the body until the body catches up with it, which it soon will. At nine weeks, you can see that so-called tail is gone. The baby's eyes are formed and covered with eyelids that are fused shut at this point. The fingers and toes are visible now, and the baby's moving almost continually, but the mother can't feel it yet. By 11 weeks, the fetus has grown to about one and a half to two inches long. The fingernails are now developing along with teeth and taste buds. The baby can swallow at this point, although it's too early to distinguish the gender, the genitals are forming. At 12 weeks, the baby has grown to about two to two and a half inches in length and weighs approximately a half an ounce. Up until now, the mother has supplied the water in the amniotic sac, but now the fetal kidneys are secreting urine that passes into the amniotic fluid. This helps make up the needed volume of fluid in the sac. The baby actually breathes this fluid into its lungs and swallows it. By doing so, the lungs and the digestive system are strengthened. This amniotic fluid allows for a cushioned area for the baby to move freely about and to exercise its body for proper bone growth. The temperature is held steady in the womb by the amniotic fluid. It also protects the baby from external blows and, in addition, prevents the umbilical cord from pinching and cutting off the needed supply to the baby. From 14 to 16 weeks, the baby's growth rate accelerates. By the 16th week, it has grown to four to five inches and weighs approximately three to three and a half ounces. By now, the skin is covered with a fine hair called Lanugo. The baby can now grasp with his hands and do somersaults and is able to hear and respond to sounds. Peaceful music such as hymns and scripture songs are very edifying for both you and your baby. Join me next time for more about our divine design. Oh, for a closer walk with God.